Hello and welcome to our special live coverage of the University of Montevallo's 22nd Annual Life Raft Debate. I'm Dr. Bruce Finkley. Thanks for joining us on the Montevallo for You YouTube channel. You're taking a live look over at Palmer Auditorium where the Life Raft Debate will get underway in just a few minutes. But uh, before we get started, uh, we want to kind of set the scene for you. We're anchoring this coverage here from Strong Hall uh, in our television studio at the University of Montevallo. And this live stream is brought to you by UM's Mass Communication Program. So what is the Life Raft Debate? Let's set the stage for that. The Life Raft Debate is set after a fictional catastrophic disaster. Humanity must be rebuilt, but there's only space for one person on the raft. The faculty members who you will see on stage shortly will be defending their respective disciplines trying to earn that final spot on the raft. And after their arguments are made, their fate is in your hands. The in-person and online audiences will vote for who is worthy of that final seat, and the winner will get their name added to the coveted oar. Before we head back over to Palmer Auditorium for the debate to begin, let's take a look at the faculty members who will be competing in this year's Life Raft debate. First up is Dr. Laura Bloom. She is, uh, she is an associate professor of human development and family studies. She received her PhD from UAB. Up next is Mr. Brooke Pruitt. He teaches a variety of broadcast production courses. Here, he's an assistant professor of mass communication. He earned his MFA at the University of Central Arkansas. The next person competing for the final spot on the raft is, is Dean Stephen Kraft of the Stevens College of Business. He served as the dean of the college since 2011. He earned his PhD in business, marketing, and globalization from the George Washington University School of Business. The final contestant is the reigning Life Raft Debate champion, Dr. Alex Berenger. He's an associate professor of English and the coordinator of UM's master's program in English. He earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin. Now, Dr. Uh, Berenger won last year's Life Raft Debate by arguing that English is the most important discipline to carry on civilization. He said reading stories can help us understand people better and prevent the downfall of humanity. We'll see in a few minutes what tactics he'll be able to use to try and defend that title this year. This year's Devil's Advocate, who will be arguing that none of the competitors deserve the final spot on the raft, is Dr. Stephen Parker. He's a professor of sociology here at the university, and he earned his PhD from, the, from Indiana University. And Life Raft Debate favorite Dr. Scott Varagona is back for his second turn as MC of the debate. Dr. Varagona is an associate professor of mathematics and holds a PhD from Auburn University. Now, Dr. Varagona holds a special place in Life Raft Debate history. He's the only person to win the Life Raft Debate's coveted or three times. He won in 2013, 2015, and most recently in 2017 when he competed as the Devil's Advocate. Once again, as this year's MC, Dr. Varagona is ineligible for votes. And we want you to be a part of the Life Raft Debate. So throughout the night, you can tweet us uh, using the hashtag UMLifeRaft, and you'll see some of your comments appear right there on the screen as the debate is happening live. And then later in the broadcast, you'll be able to cast your vote for who you think should get the last seat on the raft via a QR code that we'll put on the screen after all of the contestants debate. So joining us in the studio to help analyze this year's debate are communication study majors Jonathan Brewer and Ariel Hall. Thank you guys for being here. Happy to be here. Same. So as comms studies majors, how do you think your, your skills as a, as a comms major are going to help you pick apart and maybe predict who can win this year's Life Raft debate? Well, I'm pretty new to the comms department, but since I haven't had any of these professors, I think I can go in with a clear head and actually get to see what kind of new things they'll throw at us this, this year. Yeah, and I, uh, I had Behringer last, uh, a few years ago, and last year I was on the panel as well, and we talked about who we thought was going to win. And uh, I'm excited to see what kind of new ideas people bring to the table. I know we had PowerPoints last year. Uh, and each of these things can be tactics to utilize in an argument, utilize in your uh, speech and it's all about using rhetoric to your uh, you know using the strengths of rhetoric to convince people to your point of view 
And uh, I'm excited to see how people utilize those kinds of things to be persuasive. What are some of the persuasive strategies you, that you think we might see tonight? Well, uh, one of the things that we focus on uh, is uh, logos, pathos, and ethos appeals. So appeals to logic, emotion, and credibility. So you want to seem like you know what you're talking about, but you also want to be an emotional enough that you connect to people on a personal level. And I feel like a lot of the a lot of the winners in previous life raft debates have been very good about doing that. They've shown that they know what they're talking about. They know uh, why they should be on that life raft. And they also appeal to people's emotions in a way that stirs them up to act. Because that's a big thing is you want people to act. So, so any early predictions about, how you, uh, about who you think may take home the oar for this year's debate? I am personally rooting for Dr. Berenger. I was very convinced with his speech last year, and I think that um, he's going to get me again. So, I'm the same way. I'm really looking forward to hearing Berenger again. But I always do like to hear what the devil's advocate has to say. I feel like that's a really interesting and unique kind of position for someone to take. So I'm excited to see how that is, because I don't think we had one last year. So I can't remember. Yeah, I don't uh, think we did, <laughs> but I'm not sure. So, um, you know, it, it's always interesting to see. So you, you've kind of got a, a record to defend as well. So um, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, Stephanie Michael will be joining you guys for some debate analysis after the debate. Um, but right now, before, uh, as, as we head to break, uh, let's take a, a quick peek over at Palmer as they're getting ready to take the stage uh, for the 2019 Life Raft debate here at the University of Montevallo. So we'll see you, uh, we'll see you throughout the night for some more analysis. Thanks for watching. Create your future in art. You belong at Montevallo. Greek life at Montevallo doesn't conform to stereotypes. Through our eight sororities and six fraternities, you'll find lifelong friendships, positive influences, and a diverse campus community. Visit youbelong at montevallo.com to learn more. How's it going, folks? Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the Life Rap Debate. Gonna sit at my nameplate here. All right, so welcome, welcome, everyone here. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge some of the many people who made this debate possible. This year's, uh, excuse me, this year's organizers, the formidable duo of Andrea Eckelman and Amy Mellon. Both of them, yes, yes. <laughs> Both of them uh, are former debate participants, by the way. Michael and Cheryl Patton, the founding parents of the Life Raft Debate. The MassCom folks who make the live stream happen. All student and faculty volunteers who have worked behind the scenes. All the debate participants, past, present, and future. And of course, you, the wonderful audience. Thank you. So as Amy Mellon told me, making this year's Life Raft debate happen was important to many people. And that's why individuals from all four of UM's colleges uh, are coming together to support Dr. Patton's vision. Thank you all once again for helping us carry on this wonderful and unique UM tradition. Thank you. So now we set the scene. <laughs> A great calamity has occurred. The floodwaters have risen, 
and the last survivors of humanity, you, have crowded into a life raft. You are almost ready to sail off and reboot civilization. But wait, one seat on the life raft remains open, and there are four professors in the water, each representing a different academic discipline. Each professor will argue for why they and their subject matter is the one indispensable thing you will need to bring along with you. And then, at the end, you will decide which professor, if any, climbs aboard the raft and which ones are left to drown. <laughs> and by the way, I hope that this time we can actually, you know, get on with rebuilding civilization like we keep saying we're going to do. I don't know about you, but uh, I have been stuck on this raft for seven years. <laughs> Do you see how long my hair has gotten? Yeah. I've become an animal. You should have saved Emily Gill last year. She had scissors. <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> perhaps it's time to introduce the other panelists. Let's get started. First up, last year's winner, representing English. So let's hope he remembers to cite his sources. Please welcome Alex Berenger. Oh, yeah, I'm going to need for you to relinquish that oar, by the way. Thank you. All right, next up. Representing mass communication, the very discipline which makes our live stream possible right now. Hi, Mom. <laughs> A newcomer to this debate, please welcome Brooke Pruitt. <laughs> nice pillow. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next. From the Michael E. Stevens College of Business, representing marketing, here's the cleverest, dare I say, the craftiest businessman I know. <laughs> Give it up for Dean Kraft. <laughs> and finally, representing family and consumer sciences, I'm hoping she will teach me how to do something I'm bad at, managing my life. Another newcomer to the, to the debate, please welcome to the stage, Laura Bloom. All right. So here's how it goes. Each panelist will get approximately seven minutes for their initial statement. Uh, if you go over time, I will uh, stand next to you ominously, and the crowd will start to murmur. <laughs> but hey, no pressure. Then we will take turns doing rebuttals. And then my favorite part, the devil's advocate will have his say. <laughs> It's not me this year, though, so. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. I don't have to be the devil's advocate every year. <laughs> After that, we will vote. And just to let you know, this year we're trying a new voting uh, format. Uh, at the end, a QR code will be shown on the screen, and scanning it will lead you to an online poll 
where you will, will vote. So yeah, no Scantrons this year. It's all online. So are we ready? Yes. Okay. Let's begin. <laughs> As uh, is the tradition, we'll begin with the defending uh, champion, and that would be Alex Berenger. So let me start by taking you back to last year. Last year, my clicker is not working. Can you just advance the slide? Oh, do I need to switch it on? <laughs> so last year, I drew funny pictures for you um, and talked to you about literature as a form of empathy. It was pretty great. <laughs> um, but this year I want to take things a little more seriously. I want to start by reading a poem. <laughs> there once was a man from Nan... Tuck... Okay. Here's the real one. <laughs> day after day, day after day, we stuck nor breath nor motion as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water, everywhere, all the boards did shrink. Water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oil, burned green and blue and white. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. Ah, well a day what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. Okay. Now, this is from Coleridge's Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Um, which, by the way, was also adapted as a really awesome issue of Hellboy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, there are a lot of reasons I like this poem. It's got adventure, terror, scenes of intense beauty, clever language, lots of weird humor. Um, it's even got a wedding at the end. Um, but mostly, it's a cautionary tale about what happens when we lose touch with our humanity. Um, the scene I just read from you uh, came from the middle of the poem where our narrator is being punished for an act against nature. The whole premise of the poem is that the mariner is telling a story about how he and his men fall into hard times at sea. He describes how an albatross, this strange looking bird, is circling the ship, you know. And the other sailors uh, look at this and they think it's a sign of natural beauty. They think it's a sign of goodwill. You know, they say the albatross is what makes the wind blow. It fills the sails for us. Um, but the mariner is indifferent to this. You know, the mariner looks at this and he's it's just a bird. And so he, in this kind of callous, senseless act, um, shoots it with his crossbow and, and says, well, job well done, that's it. Um, but this turns out to be a grave mistake. The albatross's death rouses the wrath of the spirits, uh, which brings us to the scene I just read. Uh, the boat is drifting, the sun's getting hot, slimy, creepy, crawly things are closing in from all sides. And in a stunning bit of imagery, the mariner finds that instead of a cross, he has an albatross about his neck. Right? Creepy, right? Yeah? Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> it's supposed to be creepy, right? Um, and so following this scene, things only get creepier. This pale kind of skeleton woman with bright red lips arrives and plays a game of dice with the mariner. Psst, yeah, that's right. Um, and the next thing you know, she casts a curse on all the men in the ship. Right, and they start dropping one by one, right? And their, their souls fly up like arrows. Four times 50 living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan. With a heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they drop down one by one. And so the mariner is left all alone, cursed to wander land and sea, 
telling people his cautionary tale of how his indifference to nature and his indifference to his fellow men led to this catastrophe. Okay. And so at this point, I'm sure you're asking, what is the point of all this? Are you trying to get chucked off the raft? <laughs> to which I would reply, I'm getting there, okay? I'm getting, give me, give me a break. Um, you see, the mariner's crime, the, the reason he shoots the albatross is because he moves about the world in this fog, this haze, right? He's insensitive to nature, he's insensitive to the, the sentiments of his fellow men, right? Um, and, and so he hasn't cultivated any kind of sensitivity to anything but himself, you know? And I don't think we have to stretch too hard to think about how these insights apply to our current predicament and, and Varagona's long hair. Um, <laughs> You know, that sort of insensitivity is, is, I think, readily read as a kind of metaphor for climate change. You know, we kind of look the other way on things. We shut ourselves off to the world. We might even read it as um, a symbol of our current political discord, where people are kind of retreating into their own little holes, right? Just seeing only their own perspective. Um, but what fascinates me about this poem is that in addition to these kind of potent metaphors, um, it makes a case for literature. You see, Coleridge and his buddies in the Romantic movement believed that literature offered a solution to this kind of haze, right? This sense of indifference that causes the mariner to unthinkingly shoot the albatross in the first place. Uh, to that end, Coleridge's uh, good friend William Wordsworth would write that all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, okay? All good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And by this, he meant that reading, storytelling, figurative language, this captures the texture of our emotions, our deeper selves, the stuff of real life. It brings a kind of sensitivity to the world around us. And I don't just mean that in terms of learning a lesson or getting like the moral of the story, like in Aesop's fables. You know, that's a kind of simple way of thinking about it. Um, what I mean is that, that by being fully immersed in figurative language, connects us to this kind of heightened form of experience, right? It's sort of um, life plus, right? We reconnect with ourselves, we reconnect with other people around us, we reconnect with our natural surroundings. And this is the case whether we're shedding a tear over a Shakespearean drama, jumping out of our seats at a horror movie, or laughing at, at a funny comic. You knew I couldn't resist, right? <laughs> and so all of these things remind us of what it means to feel something deeply. They connect us to our feelings, to our surroundings, to each other. In short, they make us more human. And that, my friends, is still something we need on the life raft. Thank you so much. What exactly does my hair have to do with climate change? <laughs> I don't think I quite caught that. <laughs> Time to move on to the next panelist. We'll just go in order like this. So next up will be Brooke Pruitt. <laughs> you, sorry, you're gonna come up here or stay yes. there? All right, Brooke Pruitt. and I'm here to persuade you to vote for me. Why should you vote for me? Well, in MassCom, we have this thing that we do where we persuade, we inform, we educate, and we entertain. And I hope you're like me. I really like the entertainment part. I want to entertain you 
and uh, I hope you find that I'm kind of funny, I hope, maybe not, but um, I'm going to try my best, um, and I have a little com comedic routine that I'm going to try, and uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes, so who here is ready for a little comedy? Well, I'm glad because uh, you kind of don't have another option because that's the only thing I prepared for. So, <laughs> all right, here we go. Hello, my name is Mr. Brooke Pruitt, and I desire to be called by my middle name, Brooke. That's right, Brooke. B R O O K, no E. Yes, I have a marine friend who refuses to call me Brooke. He insists on calling me Brooke because Brooke is a feminine name. <laughs> I'm pretty excited because I'm going to go see him next week. I haven't saw him in a while. He lives over in Hoover by the river with his boyfriend. <laughs> I sure hope his boyfriend doesn't call me Brooks. <laughs> I grew up in a small town called BB, Arkansas. That's right, BB, your dream hometown. <laughs> Pfft, yeah. That's what I say. Hope nobody's watching from BB right now. Uh, sorry, <laughs> just joke. Um, but BB, yes, zip code 72012, area code 501, the school mascot, a meth cook. <laughs> yeah. The logo is a, a bent spoon over a cigarette lighter. <laughs> I teach at the number one university in the state of Alabama for sports. Esports. Esports. Falcons! That's right, the University of Montevallo. When I was in uh, school, I didn't know what I wanted to be. But right now, I am uh, assistant professor of mass communication here in the mass communication program. But growing up, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, in 1993, when I started school, or college, I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. To be more specific, a gynecologist. <laughs> the obvious reason for a 21-year-old male Money. <laughs> uh, I have one more. <laughs> uh, so uh, y'all know about Facebook and all that stuff. Uh, I've been looking for my ex-girlfriend, uh, Stephanie Cody. Stephanie, if you're out there, I need to properly break up with you. I have this relationship in my mind for 35 years. Uh, but I was looking for you on Facebook, and uh, as I was typing in her name, thank goodness I only got to S-T-E, and my wife came in the room and said, who's Steve? Uh, is Stephen, Stephen Marshall. He's a friend from high school. You don't know her. 
him, it's a him, it's a boy, not a girl, nope, not another woman. Now my wife and I have a joint Facebook account. <laughs> so, with that being said, I would hope that uh, you laughed a little bit and chuckled, and that's kind of what we do over in MassCom. We, we have newspapers, we have radio, we have TV, we have online things as well. So uh, we have news, not fake news, but news. So uh, we, um, that's what we do. That's my passion. So if it behooves you, please vote for Brooke. Thank you. Our next panelist. <laughs> our next panelist, representing Family and Consumer Sciences, is Laura Bloom. How you doing? All right! <laughs> I am from New Jersey, just FYI. So here we are, all gathered, facing a life or death situation. I'm here tonight representing the amazing Department of Family and Consumer Sciences, or better known as FCS. FCS, you ask. To begin with, it was one of the first majors here at UM when it was a women's college, which makes it very old and very wise. FCS is the field of study focused on the science and art of living and working well in our complex world. And this raft is getting awfully complex, isn't it? Areas of focus include the culinary arts, food science and nutrition, event planning, health and wellness, infant, child, and human development, family relations, marriage, my husband's here, and human sexuality. Yes, yes, the birds and the bees. You got it. We also cover personal and family finance, textiles, apparel, and retail. FCS is all about life. Sustainable practices, consumerism, Leadership principles and recognizing diversity are woven throughout the content area. We focus on prevention rather than intervention. So why pick me? Why pick FCS for that one seat left on the raft? I'm going to tell you. By not leaving me to drown, First, you're going to be saving my life, but also yours. First, listen up. I'll help you forge for food as we drift along, and I will give you delicious and nutritious ways to fix that food. I will help you when you're emotionally drained, and I will help us all get along on the raft. You will develop appropriate conflict resolution <laughs> skills under my watch. Yeah. Yeah. And 
And as for the one who set off that nuclear bomb in the first place, what a shame they didn't have their social and emotional skills nurtured at the Child Study Center here on campus. I am also faculty director of the Child Study Center. <laughs> help repair the raft if it develops a leak and repair your clothes when they become tattered because we will all work together so well on the raft I'm confident that we will find a deserted island and begin rebuilding our society there I can continue to help even more I will organize a welcoming event once we arrive on the island I can make us beer and wine <laughs> We are going to celebrate the founding of our new life. I will assist you in career management as you begin new jobs. I will guide you as you build your new homes, schools, and other buildings. I will implement sustainability projects, and I will assist you in creating an individual prosperity plan so that each of you will begin building your own nest egg as you begin to procreate and create new lives i will teach your children and support you as you create strong meaningful relationships and healthy families i will literally carry you from the womb to the tomb <laughs> I will assist you in maximizing your strengths and abilities and truly help you flourish. Thank you, and please say yes to FCS. Gosh, Laura, that, that makes us mathematicians sound like a bunch of deadbeats. <laughs> what do we do? Just, you know, prove a few theorems, you know, do some math. And... You're I'll saving save the you. world, apparently. <laughs> <That's right. Yeah. laughs> who, who knew? That's and right. now, at last, our final panelist, Dean Stephen Kraft. Good evening. How's it going? All right. Why do you want business on that life raft? Why must business be on that life raft? I will tell you one word, one four letter word, four little letters, and it's love. That's why you need business on that life raft, because of love. So do a thought experiment with me, all right? I really want you to do this. Now, think about in a typical week, a typical week in your life, how much time do you spend staring into the eyes of your significant other, of your crush, of a person that you love? How much time? Seriously. Think about it. You can, you can look into their eyes. Look into the eyes of the person that you love, a person who loves you. You can see forever. You see your own self reflected, your own best self reflected. How much time do you spend? Think about it. Tell it, come up with a number. We'll call it, we'll call it 10 minutes, all right? <laughs> now let's think about that. And how much time do you spend with people who you really love? So how much time do you spend in a typical week, you know, looking into the eyes of your crush or making love or petting your, <laughs> petting your dog or pet? <laughs> Come on, add these up. <laughs> add them up as we go. <laughs> Chatting or having coffee with your siblings or a close cousin. Uh, checking, you know, having some FaceTime with your parents or grandparents just to check in on them. Uh, we'll even include your, your friends who feel like family. You're just having dinner with them. How much time is that? So add all that up together and figure out how much time in a week do you spend face-to-face, -face, in person, 
with people that you love. What do you got? 45 minutes? 90? If you tell me that it's more than two hours, I'll think you're lying. I won't believe you. So have that number in your mind. How much time do you spend with people you love? And now compare that with how much time you spend on your phone. Raise your hands if you spend more time with your phone than with people that you love. Uh-huh. The rest of you are lying. You know it's true. You know you spend more time on your phone than you do with your, with your loved ones. Be honest. The true love of your life is your smartphone. It's true. It's true. You know it's true. If you were caught in a house fire tonight, your house caught on fire, are you gonna grab a photo album? No, you're gonna grab your phone. Now you might make, take great pains to get your dog or your sister out of the burning house, but you're gonna have your phone in your hand first. That's the first thing you're gonna grab. If your car veered off the road into a lake, you're grabbing your phone and taking it with you. You don't care how fast the water's rising or how fast it's rushing into the car. You're going to take your phone. You love your phone. So, and I'm sure you really can see your best self reflected in the eyes of the person you love, but not as clearly as you see them in the forward-facing camera on your iPhone <laughs> when you're taking a selfie. That's where you can really see your true self. Consider all the things in this life that you love. You love your phone, you love Instagram, Snapchat, Spotify, TV shows about Kardashians and all their people related to them. Taco Bell, video games, YouTube, Hulu, Amazon Prime. You love the fact that people sitting around you are wearing deodorant. You might not think about it, <laughs> but if business stopped making deodorant, you'd be thinking about it a lot. All the things you love in this life are brought to you by business. In fact, yeah, I'm going to go there, I'm going to say it. Many of you, perhaps even most of you, couldn't even hook up if it weren't for business. <laughs> now, my, my lovely wife is here, and I have been with her for 30 years. So I have been out of the dating pool a long time. We're in a 30-year relationship. But you know what? And my, my dating days all predated cell phones and technology. But you think I'm not listening, like when I walk into class or I'm in the breezeway over by Comber. You think I'm not listening, but I am. So I hear enough. I have a pretty good idea about how your dating relationships work, even though I've been out of the dating pool a long time. So here's what, here's what you're doing from what I hear. You're going online and you're finding pictures of people and then you're swiping. And I don't know which way you swipe, but you swipe. And then if you both swipe the picture the same direction, then somehow you get connected. And then once you get <laughs> somebody's swiping right now. Somebody in the audience swiping their phone. And then you, somebody, especially if there's a guy involved, then will use a smartphone to take a picture of their private parts and send it, which frankly, I just don't get. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand the appeal of it or why you do it. And then I guess, based upon the strength of the picture, one of you, I mean, I don't know how you make these decisions, but based upon the strength of the picture, one of you invites the other over to watch Netflix, but not really. <laughs> You're not really going to watch Netflix. So then you hook up with Netflix streaming in the background and nobody really paying attention to it. Then the next day you rush, try to be the first one to get to social media to block that person and ghost them. <laughs> and then you start the process over with somebody new. Now, the whole thing, again, as an outsider, the whole thing just seems dreadful, but you must like it because you keep doing it. <laughs> Bumble, Grindr, Tinder, they're all businesses. The phone is a product of business. Your self-portrait of your, you know what, is, is created by a phone. 
connected to a phone created by business on a data network run by business, on a cellular network run by business. The, the, the Netflix is a business. The screen you're not watching it on was created by business, and all the content on Netflix was created by business. If you find yourself in this brave new world without business, you have no cell phone, no internet service, no social media, is that really living? <laughs> exactly, it's not. Think of it. If you're fortunate enough, you all guys already have your spot on the lifeboat. If you're fortunate enough to be on the lifeboat, but you can't post on Instagram about it, is it real? <laughs> have you actually even survived? If you can't post a picture of what they serve for dessert on the new island the first night and post that on Instagram, <laughs> it doesn't count. If the friends you leave behind in the post-atomic nuclear horror can't go online and see your pictures as they're dying and say, oh, she's on the lifeboat, but she's so cute. Uh, you know, fire emoji, fire emoji, smiley face. <laughs> if they can't react to it, it's not real. A world without Netflix, a, without all your Snapchat streaks are gone. And no cell phones or technology, nothing at all. A world without business, it's a world where the living envy the dead. It's a world where the living envy the dead. A world without business is a hellscape. A hellscape, I say. <laughs> Devoid of all the things you love brought to you by your friends in business. So I urge you to include business in the life raft for your own sake, for the sake of the culture, and for the sake of love. Thank you. <laughs>
you know, and we would never look at, at communications and think to wonder what it could possibly have to do with uh, push-ups, <laughs> meth labs, and gynecology. <laughs> we would never think to ask those questions because we're all about inspiration, the sweetness and the light in English. Um, and, you know, we would never express our skepticism about all these children that are being promised on the life raft. <laughs> you know, last month I took a flight across the country and I had one of those middle seats on Spirit Airlines. I, I don't know why I bring this up, you know. I, I, but anyway, you know, so when we think about all these children on the life raft and, you know, these screaming, I mean, beaming <laughs> children, it just sounds wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say anything about my fellow competitors because we in English, we're idealists. We're all about inspiration. That's, that's just who we are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Berenger, for not giving a rebuttal so well. <laughs> On to the next one, then. We'll hear once again, I'm a little afraid, but <laughs> we'll hear once again, representing MASCOM, Brooke Pruitt. OK. So my rebuttal is a rebuttal, and it's directed at my three colleagues, and I'll just start with Dean Kraft. Okay. I'm sorry, but we're not going on this life raft uh, with the idea of Marxism and capitalism, nor Kraftism. Money and marketing are not what we are rafting towards. Money is evil. Marketing is a lie. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen, but the buck stops here. <laughs> Where we're going, if I'm selected, we don't need money. We don't need jobs. We don't need corporations. We don't need loans. We don't need business transactions, nor jobs. We are going to play and have fun, and I'm going to entertain you. And I promised to keep my clothes on. Because when I was in college, I took my clothes off and ran around in my leopard print speedo. But I don't do that no more because I'm married. <laughs> on to Laura. Laura, Laura, Laura. Oh, me. Many of my elders have since passed away. And they would often tell me, Brooke, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say nothing at all. So I'll leave it at this. Laura, Laura, Laura. <laughs> Life ain't fair. <laughs> Alex Berenger, Alex Berenger, Alex Berenger. <laughs> While 19th century American literature is important. We don't want to read. <laughs> that. If you want to smile and laugh, vote for Mr. Pruitt and Mass Calm, but I want to leave you at this. I have a promise. I deserve to win if I can do a magic trick and I do it right, but I need a little help. I need help from somebody who is not in my classes and is not mass comm, is not communication studies, uh, that has, I have not had you in class. Okay, the thing is, I have to touch you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't know you. I, 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 I have to be able to touch your head and receive. Okay, 
the gentleman right here, I want you to come up here. What is your name? What's your name, sir? Jackson. Jackson. Come on up here to the stage around here. I deserve to lose if I can't do this. Jackson, this is going to be a regular piece of eight. Um, I don't even know what they are. They are washable crayons. Check them out, sir. We don't, I don't know him. I do not know him from Adam, but his name's Jackson. My name's Brooke. Brooke, or not Brooks. Okay, yes. Open that up, sir. Okay, the thing is, I cannot see what he chooses. He's going to select a crayon. Please don't blurt it out. I don't come to your work and harass you, so leave me and Jackson alone as he picks the color. He's going to put it in my hand. I'm going to squeeze his head, and he's going to... Tell me through his brain synapse what the color is. If I'm not right, I deserve to lose, but I promise I'm going to entertain you. All right. Jackson, put that crayon in my hand, please, sir. Or, I'm sorry, show the audience what it is. I promise I don't have anything in my ear to... Did you show everybody what it was? Everybody see what the color is? Y'all see it? You saw what it was? All right, you can sit that down right there, okay? All right, Jackson, with the power from your synapsi. <laughs> oh, please, sir, don't be thinking that. Think of the color, please, <laughs> the color. All right. Okay, I promise, if I get this wrong, I deserve to lose. But I'm so confident that I'm going to win. Jack, not Jackson, you got to come back. I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness, Jackson. I have not looked at the color, have I? I know what it is. I'm so excited. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. You don't think I could guess it. I haven't looked at the color. It's yellow! Yeah! It's yellow! <laughs> was it yellow? Yeah, it was yellow. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> I guessed it. I'm an entertainer. I'd be dang. How did I do that? I, I say, yes, that's, uh, yeah. Um, uh, well, in math, you have a 1-8 chance. So I guess I guessed right. <laughs> or maybe it was just, it was in your heart all along. It was in Jackson's synapse. He just helped me out. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. You're speechless. I, I really am. Next. <laughs> Next, for the rebuttal period, time to hear once again from Laura Bloom, FCS. Well, this is going to be short and sweet. You probably already have picked up that FCS is a part of all of these participants. So I really don't have to argue, but I do have a couple things I want to say. First of all, regarding English, I am the inspiration. Not only can I hush those sweet little babies, and stop that crying, but I can teach them to read and write poems and sing songs and get along. <laughs> Brooke, all I have to say is I can save your meth head mascot. Dean Kraft, with all due respect, before you can love anyone, you have to be authentic with yourself and love yourself, okay? We don't need phones or technology to do all that. And I actually hooked up the old-fashioned way.
And regarding that deodorant you mentioned, I can help make that. We don't need Netflix or business or anything else without meeting people's basic needs. So here we go, FCS. Thank you. All right then, we're down to our final panelist here. For the rebuttal, let's hear from Dean Stephen Kraft. Thank you. First, in terms of English, you can't share poetry or any other kind of literature without the publishing business. It's very great to produce a poem, but no one's going to see it or enjoy it. It doesn't mean anything if no one's there to publish it. You have to have business. Mass communication. Mass communication can be very valuable, but you can't operate without the network, without business, being able to communicate with people. As far as, you know, <laughs> meth head mascots, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Business has to be in that last seat of the life raft. Wow. We, we, we killed him with the truth. Family and consumer science. Well, we've already established that we're talking about a world, if you're talking about a world without business, it's a world where the, the living are going to envy the dead. Who's going to form a home or have any kind of domestic life in a world that everyone's so despondent? It just doesn't work. Plus, consumers, without business, there's nothing to consume. There are no consumers without business in the life raft. So there's just, there's no way that the world can survive without business. Business has to be in that last seat. You know it. You know who to vote for when the time comes. Thank you very much. Short and sweet, I like it. All right. Now, before you choose one of these professors, remember, you can also choose none of the above. For that, there is one other member of our community whose voice must be heard. A legend of the life raft debate a former debate winner, the king of sarcasm, the sultan of cynics, the one true devil's advocate, Dr. Steve Parker. Is that the sultan of the cynic? The sultan of cynics. You can set your, your water over I'll here. That. It's good evening. It's good to be here. Uh, this is difficult to prep for. I didn't know what they were going to say. I wasn't sure how they were going to defend their disciplines or their areas of study. Uh, and yet, bless their hearts, they tried. I put away childish things. I have some specific comments about individual participants and then perhaps some themes. So let me get to it and I have to uh, rip some paper here. I was back in the dark trying to take notes. We'll now find out if I can read them. Um, well, let, let me first say, these are all good people. You know, I respect them as colleagues, as human beings, as, as friends. I would, uh, I would take Brooke home to meet my mother. <laughs> or, or maybe a great aunt, you know, to be honest. I'd love to go out to have coffee with Dr. Blue. Have a beer and talk motorcycles with Dean Kraft smoke opium and have dreams about big birds on boats uh, or, or whatever it is that I, 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 I can be flexible. That's all right. 
uh, with, with Brooke. He came out here and the first thing I thought was he's trying to motivate me to sell vacuum cleaners. <laughs> there was just that tone. There was also something, he made it clear what we do at MassCom. And I'm, I'm glad he pointed that out because I haven't really been sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and then he went through a whole list of we don't need, we don't need, we don't need, we don't need mass comm professors. <laughs> uh, please, we're all adults here. We all agreed to participate. Dr. Berenger, a professor of English, and yet when he explains things, I feel like I need a translator. I, I, that's not helping. Uh, that he, he says, this is this great poem, and I agree, I love Coleridge. And then he has to explain it to us. So what's universal about that experience? What do we gain from the experience of an individual telling us, this is the meaning you should take from this work? A little bothered by that. But I, I, I'm not going to go on record as saying reading is a bad thing uh, that, that I think has been stated up here. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Bloom, consumer is in the title of your discipline. I consider myself a human being, an individual. And now this person devoted to the development of children and the whole thriving human beings is nonetheless defining her discipline as a discipline of consumption? I am more than that. And each of these people is more than that. Thank you, Professor Welcome Wagon. It is, it is, I'm, please. I, I, I still love to have a cup of coffee. We're just gonna have to get beyond this consumer thing. And when we come to consumers, obviously we go to business and marketing specifically. And there's just too much. <laughs> the purpose of marketing is to convince us of what we need because we're not smart enough to figure it out ourselves. I think I can figure out, these people can figure out what we need and don't need to be convinced. Secondly, you make the claim of, I know you people. The script that included sending junk pics and what era are you living in? Netflix and chill? Those, those people are long gone from the university. Uh, and another thing. It is not the businessman that makes deodorant. Person on the assembly line, industry makes deodorant. Business makes money. I'm sure there's other things, but I just can't read. Oh, Brooke, I do have to say, if I had a seven-year-old nephew that was having a birthday party, you, man, you'd be at the top of the list. That was, that was, that was some magic, okay? Uh, Dr. Bloom, you do sort of remind me of a second grade school teacher in one of those Why I Hate School movies. There was, there was an, you didn't notice an edge to her voice? We will have order, or else. And that or else was there. I, I was a little frightened, quite honestly. And that's why we're still on the boat. But let me move on. Each of these people claim their disciplinary pers perspective holds the answer. The one great truth that we need and only they can deliver. They speak of their disciplines. And honestly, with the exception of English, I'm not sure these are disciplines. They're areas of study, and that's fine. But, but that's something semantic that we can talk about if they were willing to talk. And I'm not sure they are. That they speak of their disciplines as Gollum speaks of the ring. 
It's my precious. And indeed, they speak as if Gollum had the ring. There is a self-righteous power that they want to extend to you to, to convince you they have the answers. The goal of all of this is to understand, to understand other perspectives, to think outside the box, to challenge ourselves and to ask questions, to have doubt, creative doubt. That is where the answers eventually will come from, not from an individual silo. For them, there are no boxes apart from their own. This debate has been a test, and I would suggest it's a test that they have failed, a test of their humanity. They have taken themselves as individuals and reduced themselves to the specific substance of their disciplines as if there is no world outside of it, as if there are no questions they have, haven't already asked and answered. They act that they present themselves not as whole people. They forget that when we all cut, we bleed. They forget that all of us express joy in the wonders of the world and that we are capable of empathy when others suffer. They've forgotten that science and art produce questions, not answers. That there's always been a tension between what we know and the enduring questions that will go with us forever. To claim otherwise, what we have here is a 21st century example of the Tower of Babel. Each discipline speaking their own language past each other competing with each other so that no one is understood and no progress is made. They seem unwilling to offer, or what they do offer are incomplete renderings of the world. They seem unwilling or perhaps unable to consider the contributions of others unable even to consider the questions that are raised. The truths they offer consist of paralyzing incoherence. Fragmented, compartmentalized, fractured views of the world and of us, something less than whole human beings. I ask you to reject this. Sometimes there is addition by subtraction. Leave the seat empty. Allow it to represent an open-ended view of our life experience. That there are questions we don't even know we need to ask yet. Let it represent a future that is unbound by the cages of the past. Leave the seat empty. There's a better chance without someone claiming to hold the key. Thank you. And with that, the time to vote is here. We will have a QR code uh, put up on the screen. You can scan the QR code uh, with your phone. If necessary, some may need I'm to obtain a, a QR app, but I'm told some phones can automatically uh, scan it. Once you do, it will take you to the online poll, and you can vote for, once again, I'll remind you, uh, we have Brooke Pruitt of MassCom, Alex Berenger, English, Laura Bloom, FCS, Dean Stephen Kraft, College of Business, and the Devil's Advocate, Dr. Steve Parker. Uh, so we will now uh, give you approximately 15 minutes to vote. After that, we will cut it off, and then uh, we will tabulate the results and make an announcement. You should be able to scan it from where you're sitting.
listen, adds to her voice, we will have order or else. And that or else was there. I, I was a little frightened, quite honestly. And that's why we're still on the boat. But let me the wrong guy. Uh, because in English, we're idealists, right? We're all about the inspiration. Um, like Matthew Arnold, the sweetness, the light. <laughs> and so I have a modest proposal. Uh, I, I'm not going to criticize my fellow competitors. Um, it just wouldn't be what English does, you know, because in English, we're not like Oscar Wilde going to say something like, some people bring happiness wherever they go, and some people bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> right? Before you can love anyone, you have to be authentic with yourself and love yourself. Okay? We don't need phones or technology to do all that. And I actually hooked up the old-fashioned way. <laughs> no way that the world can survive without business. Business has to be in that last seat. You know it. You know who to vote for when the time comes. Thank you very much. Montevallo is listed as one of the most beautiful public college campuses, but it has so much more than good looks. It's been named a College of Distinction seven years running. Plus, it offers 75 majors and the chance to belong to more than 90 campus organizations. Visit youbelong at montevallo.com to learn more. Montevallo is listed as one of the most beautiful public college campuses, but it has so much more than good looks. It's been named a College of Distinction seven years running. Plus, it offers 75 majors and the chance to belong to more than 90 campus organizations. Visit youbelong at montevallo.com to learn more. Coverage. So I'm here with, with Jonathan and Ariel. So this is definitely one of the more interesting uh, life raft debates that we've seen. Uh, so first impressions? I felt, like, I felt like a lot of the people, uh, they were much livelier than they were last year. Um, but I feel like there was some boomerang effect because there was a lot of uh, hostility. Um, like uh, at one point, uh, Kraft called a lot of the audience members liars if they felt like they had spent two hours or more, you know, in front of people they loved. And I know I spend a lot of time with my family. And so whenever I heard that, I was like, I was like, wait a second. And I feel like that might have bounced back. Um, but then I also thought that uh, maybe on Behringer's side, I thought his arguments were strong, but I felt like he didn't have as much of a strong uh, emotional connection with the audience. I liked his sass and his sarcasm, um, but I felt like uh, he wasn't as persuasive as he could have been personally. Um, I kind of feel the same about Behringer. I think he did, he had a pretty sound argument and I really liked his rebuttal, but I think it could have, he could have gone a different direction. I feel like um, with last year and him having such a strong emotional connection with the audience, um, he could have used that differently and I was a little, disappointed with how he used it. Mm -hmm. um, I personally really like Bloom for this year. Um, I think she did a really good and thorough job of actually examining like what FCS means and like how it actually contributes to what we do in society. And um, I really liked the idea that Kraft had with um, business being such a big part of our world and because we're so technology based, but um, I think that Bloom had a really strong argument, so. I thought it was interesting as, as we were watching Dean Kraft, um, he kept talking about mass communication yep. in, in business terms, and I was like, well, which one are you, you. you pulling for? Um, so speaking of mass comm, let's talk about, I think, the, uh, the act of the night. Uh, what are your thoughts about Brooke Pruitt's uh, comedy routine slash magic show? Um, got it, people's attention. <laughs> it definitely was not what I was expecting it to be. I don't particularly think it was a strong argument. Um, it was entertaining for sure, but I don't think it was really what the crowd was looking for. So I don't think he is going 
to win, but um, I for sure enjoyed the show. I mean, the, the magic trick, uh, I'm all for a good magic trick, uh, but part of a magic trick is presentation. That's mm -hmm. like a big part of it. And, uh, you know, your points can be strong, your message can be strong, but if you're not delivering it in a way that uh, sends the messages you're trying to send, it can kind of cause problems. And I feel like whenever he was trying to entertain, that was something he talked about, uh, I felt like he was entertaining, but he was uh, possibly entertaining for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. because he wasn't, uh, you know, we, like he didn't show off what color marker, or a color crayon it was, you know, it was just kind of like, well, I'm going to do this and hopefully they'll like it, and I, I feel like it could have been stronger. So. so, you know, when we were watching and we get to see some crowd reaction, uh, it, it seemed like Dr. Bloom had a lot of fans there in the audience. Did you guys pick up on on anything from kind of crowd reaction that may kind of give us a, a not to a, a magic trick, but could uh, predict the future here mm -hmm. for the, the winner of this year's debate? I think th a lot of people responded really well to Bloom. Uh, I think um, some people thought it was very interesting, uh, her take on the game of life, I guess you could say, in the way she put it. Um, I think Berenger using her, his comics as, that, I feel like that's his brand, yep. was a really good idea for him. And, and we're getting word, so we know that the, the QR code to vote uh, was having some issues, but they've got a web link, and you can see it there on your screen, so if you go there, uh, you should be able to cast your vote uh, for who you think should get that final spot on the live raft. Or remember, you, you have uh, Dr. Stephen Parker as the devil's advocate, basically saying, drown them all. Um, so I, I think, you know, what did you guys think about Dr. Parker's uh, devil's advocate position? Um, me and my parents have watched this a few years, and uh, my dad's very much of the opinion that choosing like a devil's advocate is kind of like choosing none of the above, and it kind of, uh, it has some negative attributes to it. Uh, I'm less so, I feel like it's an interesting kind of viewpoint, um, but I do feel it's easier sometimes to just be like, none of these people, you know, moving on, that kind of thing. And I, I would, I, I feel like his rebuttals, his rebuttal was strong, uh, but I feel like we have some panelists that really did bring some solid uh, arguments, solid information, and I'd, I'd like to see the audience personally uh, choose somebody like Bloom or somebody like Ber Behringer, um, as opposed to choosing like, uh, you know, like I said, like none of the above on a test or something. I'd rather them, uh, you know, I'd rather there be a winner this year as mm -hmm. opposed to just somebody swooping in, kind of like Varagona did in that last year. So. so let's talk about Dr. Varagona. How do you think he did as MC for his second time? Um, I actually had Varagona for my first semester here and he was always an entertaining person and I, I really enjoyed watching him in the life raft debate last year and I was really looking forward to seeing him him again this year, and I actually really enjoyed it. I think he always brings an interesting taste to the debate. So obviously we don't know who's going to win this year. Um, so real quick predictions for the winner. Who do you think? I think Bloom. I, I, I think Bloom as well. I want it to be Behringer personally, uh, but I, I have bias because I, mm -hmm. I was in one of his classes. So, so let's look into the crystal ball. Okay of Life Raft Debate 2020. Who are some professors on campus that you would like to see compete next year? I'm biased, and so when it, the first people that pop into my head are uh, communication studies professors, and I feel like all of them, th they would be able to construct a solid argument, uh, and they each have really different personalities. Uh, they might hate me calling them out like this, but <laughs> I would love to see uh, I, I don't know which ones have done it before. I would love to see Dr. Harding get up there and do it. Uh, I would love to see Dr. Osley go up there and do it too. I feel like I feel like both of them could have. Uh, they could be very entertaining, but they could also uh, bring some really strong and professional points. So. Do you think he would work in a three by five index card into, <laughs> his, into his pitch? Yes, he would be like he would be like audience, please. Uh, for the people that don't know, Dr. Osley, uh, during his classes, regularly asks for people to put down their thoughts or their, you know, kind of as an exit activity, pull out a three by five card, write something down that relates to the class, uh, or answer a question he has. So I could easily see him being like, uh, you know, trying to get the votes on a three by five <laughs> index card or something yeah. like that. I would love it. Awesome. So, 
So Ariel, how about, how about you? Who do you think could compete next year? Um, I'm also a little biased. A lot of my favorite professors come to mind. I know I would love to see Dr. Eckelman participate in the Life Raft debate, and I know that she has done it before, and she has won before, so I think it would be very interesting. I feel like her as a political science major could come up with a very sound argument. Um, and oh, we're getting word that Dr. Varagone is back. We're going to take you back over to Palmer. Then we will announce the winner. We should be getting those results any second. Um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Dr. Eckelman, mm -hmm. uh, who has won. We've mentioned Behringer, who's won. And it gave me the idea of what if they did like a battle of champions? Nice. You know, like, like you have like Survivor and they bring back all the past winners. Yeah. That might be a really, like, you know, bring back the, <laughs> the best of the best. We all know these people could win mm -hmm. because they've won before. That could be a really cool idea. If you're watching out there, and you want to take that idea, as long as you give us credit, we're good with that. <laughs> uh, but I, I think like a battle of champions yeah. would, would craft debate would be really interesting. I personally would love to see Eckelman and Varagona and Berenger all duke it out. Would, do you think it would be fair to bring Varagona back? That Because he's, um, he's got such a, like, a such a, like a lead against everybody else. That's true. You might, it might really depend on the mix, right? right. Because we, yeah. we've seen in past years, you know, there, there tends to be that person, like you mentioned Behringer last year, like just really connected with the audience. So it would, it would I guess, depend on which champions you brought back. Mm -hmm. But I think it could be interesting to, to see for sure. Uh, so any other thoughts about tonight's debate? Any, any rhetorical strategies that you heard uh, being used well or <laughs> not used well? I think that the professors on the panel used uh, a lot of um, logical argument, which I think is always a good idea, but I think professors specifically sometimes depend a little too much on that approach. So I wish I could have seen a little bit more of the emotional approach, which I did see a lot from Bloom, and I think that's why her argument was so strong. And so I think something Bloom did very well also was talk about the future. And a lot of people forget that the reason you put them on the life raft is so that they can continue later. And uh, you know, I saw some tweets that were like, you know, well, what happens once we get off the life raft? Like, will you be able to help? And uh, Kraft kind of touched on it, but I feel like Bloom really emphasized also like, once we get off the life raft, like the family kind of skills, like that, the, the skills that go into what she teaches here at the university uh, would be very valid and very important to have. And uh, I don't feel like a lot of the other professors on the panel really focused in on that kind of mindset the way she did. They so. focus more on getting the seat versus exactly. what you do with that. So uh, you mentioned the, the, the Twitter live stream. Uh, what are some of the, the interesting tweets that stood out to you guys? I really liked uh, one tweet about um, Kraft. It was a quote that Kraft said, without business, you're not really living. Um, I think it was an interesting take on his argument. Um, that because we do rely so heavily, and I'm like, this is really a completely hypothetical situation, but I think it's so interesting that we really do take like a two hour time out of our day and really think about like what would happen if we were stuck with one person on a life raft. Right. I mean, I I feel like uh, I feel like whenever it comes to specific strategies that people use, either positively or negatively. Um, I really liked Behringer's kind of, he, he showed off his credibility. He showed off the fact that he knew what he was talking about. Because whenever he started, to, in his rebuttal, he started listing all of these different English uh, you know, figureheads, like Mark Twain. And he started saying these, uh, you know, these lines from famous novels or that kind of thing. And he let that kind of carry his argument. And I feel like, I feel like part of that was a negative because of the emotional connection might have been not as present as it could have, but he really showed that he knew what he was talking about. And to specific audience members, that's a big deal. Because if you come across like you don't know what you're talking about, which some of the panelists may have done that, I feel like uh, you know, 
showing you know what you're talking about, showing that you know how it relates to what you're trying to do, uh, that'll get you big brownie points later on whenever people start voting for you. Check out the tweet that we've got up on the screen right now. Ariel Hall is the real MVP. Congratulations. There you go. Maybe they, they should put you on the raft. What do you what do you think? I <laughs> actually would love for us to do like a student version of this and get like a student from every college like we do with the professors. I think that would be really interesting to see. Like because so many of my friends are from different departments. I think that could be really interesting. Because I am a comms major, so I feel like I could develop a sound argument, but I would love to see what you know what other people do with it. Yeah. So we're, we're getting word from the control room that we're seeing some movement on stage. So can we take a look in Palmer and let's see uh, kind of what what's happening there? So we, oh, we see Dr. Varagona coming out. So we'll take you back over to Palmer right now. The voting has been cut off. A winner has been determined. The name of the winner is in this envelope right here. <laughs> but, but first, but first, uh, you know, I, yes, I will announce the winner of the debate in just a few moments and present them with the coveted or but first i have a different award to present and this one's personal steve parker would you please step forward come on, I'm on my way please join me on stage here uh, in the previous 4 years I have played the part of the devil's advocate, but Steve Parker, he is the devil's advocate. He has served, he has served in this role and participated in the life raft debate more times than I can count. And I'm a mathematician. You do imaginary numbers. So, as thanks uh, for your many, many years of service and for inspiring the next generation of devil's advocates, Dr. Parker, please accept this token of gratitude from me on behalf of the Life Rap debate. <laughs> Steve Parker, ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome. I don't get to make an acceptance speech, though, do I? <laughs> no. Okay. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. The votes have been tallied, and the winner is... <laughs> Laura Bloom, <laughs> FCS. Come here. Congratulations. Thank you all once again for coming out and supporting the debate. Thanks to all the participants, the organizers. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. And look forward to seeing you next year. Marketing is a convincing sending junk pics and 
marketing is to convince us of what we need because we're not smart enough to figure it out ourselves. I think I can figure out, these people can figure out. Before you can love anyone, you have to be authentic with yourself and love yourself. Okay? We don't need phones or technology to do all that. And I actually hooked up the old-fashioned way. 